Welcome to the Modern Patient Experience, a show about how U.S. healthcare is adapting to new patient expectations. I'm James Furbush, Director of Marketing at Access One, a company that empowers revenue cycle teams to help all patients effortlessly pay for care in full or over time. In each episode of this show, I interview executives from hospitals and health systems, physicians and nurse leaders, digital health pioneers, and others to better understand what it means to be truly patient-centric. The goal is to serve up new ideas, frameworks, and tactics that will help your organization give your patients the best clinical, financial, and operational experience. And away we go. Hi, welcome back to uh, this week's episode of the Modern Patient Experience. Uh, I'm your host, James Furbush, as always. Uh, this is an exciting episode for me. A topic of this week's show and my guest, I'm very excited to have on. Um, we're going to be talking about patient navigation um, and how that impacts the patient experience and why it matters. And so I am uh, so fortunate to have my guest on uh, today. He is Sergio Kihei. Um down in the Dallas, Texas area. And I'm sorry if I, I mispronounced your last name, but Sergio, I'm so excited to, to have you on. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Hey, you did pretty, uh, pretty good on the last name. So nothing to worry about there. Hey, thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, uh, like James said, I'm uh, based out of the DFW. I'm a revenue cycle uh, expert matter consultant. Um, I tackle root causes and uh, we look at net revenue and everything that affects it. So thank you again for the opportunity. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and so when we were getting to know each other, I think the sort of the topic of patient navigation uh, really um, resonated, I think with the both of us as we're talking about um, what you were gonna come on to, to talk about. And so I wanna start with you. Um, why does patient navigation, why does that matter uh, really for, to, to you personally? You're a longtime healthcare worker um, and been in this space for a long time. And so I'm curious, why is that a topic that, that kind of matters to you personally? Um, I was in, in the ER uh, sitting um, and I had just come back to, uh, to Advent Health. Um, uh, to, to work in, in, in a revenue cycle project. And I remember, uh, talking to, uh, the director and I said, Hey, listen, I really want to learn a little bit more about what revenue cycle is. Uh, why don't you put me in the trenches? And she said, the ER, everything comes through the ER. And I said, yeah, if that's where it's going to take, send me to the ER. And at that time it was uh, patient access. Uh, uh, registrations in the ER and it encompasses everything about 80% of all the patient admits to the hospital, they come through the ER. And, um, at that time, uh, the CFO was looking for a project on how to better manage our communities, every that came through our hospital. And there was a project that they gave us. And I think that's where the passion to, uh, to facilitate the navigation of the patients uh, came about because it was an idea at that point, it was just an idea that they had expressed and, um, I came up with the whole process, the interaction with the patients, uh, at the bedside, uh, we had another team member that was working with me and, uh, we started gathering data and at that point on tide on downtimes when I was not talking to any of the patients, I was calling on different, um, physicians that were in the area, the five mile radius from our hospital. And I said, Hey, listen, are you taking new patients? What kind of insurance are you taking? Uh, this and that and whatnot, what's the rate, what's your specialty? And I was making this list of all these physicians and primary care, um, doctors that were surrounded us. Yeah, uh, and to the point that I also reached out to about three or four uh, doctors that were strictly self-pay. They didn't take anything else other than self-pay. And the reason I did that is because a lot of the patients don't have insurance and they're just scared of going to a PCP because, uh, because of the cost, right? 
and for a variety of reasons. But at that point, just, I was just, gathering just things in to put it in the puzzle. And it's crazy to me, uh, the patients would be scared of the cost of going to the PCP. And yet they still felt it was better to go to the ER. Exactly. Which is the much higher cost setting, especially if you don't have insurance. Yes. Um, which is crazy. Um, so this project that you were working on is really to understand how patients were coming into the health system, which it turned out by and large, 80% of them, I think you said, were coming in first through the ER was like the front door to uh, their care journey. Is that correct? Is that kind of how I um, understand it? That 80% uh, uh, reference was a lot of the inpatient uh, patients that, that become in, that are admitted, they call oh, okay. the ER. But a lot of yeah. those patients, yeah, yeah. they came for um, level one, uh, this is ER, which were cough, pain, something that could have been addressed in, in, uh, in a clinic. So our focus to our community was to address specifically that because we wanted to reduce the cost of the ER and also reduce the wait time in the ER for those patients that did need the care, right? Because we, in the ER, you're uh, by law, you can't turn them down. So you have to see them. And even if you place them on a fast track, you're still thinking about the timing and also the physician's load in the ER. They're still seeing those patients. So our job was to uh, connect them from that ER visit and say, hey, listen, uh, what is your preference? If there was an immigrant patient, uh, find out what the language is. Uh, what is your household? Uh, speaks, oh, we only speak Spanish or we only speak, uh, Vietnamese, whatever, find a physician that, that, that has a language or interpreter on site. And, uh, we connected those patients within a month, James, we were able to connect 400 different patients, 400 patients on follow-up visits for the first time ever. They, they didn't have PCP because our method was ask the patients whenever they're on bedside. Hey, who's your PCP? Oh, I don't have a PCP. That was a red flag face sheet to us and our team. We would run and we would, before the patient was discharged, we had a follow-up conversation already and an engaged doctor with them. So it was, uh, it was a tremendous, uh, uh effort that we put, but, um, uh, about 85% of the patients that came through that didn't have a primary care physician had a primary physician connected already with an, with a scheduled appointment to follow through on the ER visit. So it was, uh, it was, uh, it was an amazing, uh, undertaking. That's amazing. What I love about sort of this story and this particular project is that like it, it started as one thing, right? Understand something that's impacting the revenue cycle. Right. And then you took it to, I am going to connect an actual person and a patient with a physician who can better serve them, uh, exactly. a patient who maybe only speaks Spanish or Vietnamese, and maybe is frightened to, doesn't know how to find a Spanish speaking physician or doesn't know how to find a physician that is like them. Um, you're able to help 400 patients, like a real number an actual person, um, to get them more comfortable with, um, a PCP and their care journey. I just absolutely loved that it started as one thing sort of ended up really, you talk about the patient experience, like bringing a patient to say, Hey, this physician is like you and is going to be able to help you and, and make you feel comfortable and get you the care you need and take care of you. It was just absolutely amazing. Um, but what did you learn from that experience? I'd love to understand as you think back about that project, what do you, what did you learn and what are some of the sort of takeaways um, that you had? The, uh, the biggest takeaway for me is that we're all in one team. We're all part of one team and our common goal, it's one. It's not metrics. It's not money or it's not how we uh, can increase volume. 
our biggest goal and main goal is to increase our community engagement and make our communities better. That's what we're there for. We're there to improve our community's health overall. Yeah. And so this being your first foray into the importance of, of patient navigation, how do you think about just the concept of, of patient navigation? If someone were to ask you, okay, uh, Sergio, why does patient navigation matter? What is it and why does it matter? Why should I care about it as a health system? Um, what would you tell them? Um, I go back to the communities. Uh, 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 we, as, a, as providers, we are stewards of our community uh, healthcare. That project, it was really interesting when we had the conversations with the C-suite and when we started showing up the numbers, I had a list of about 120 different uh, physicians and out of the 120, maybe 12 were in, uh, like in network or directly, uh, connected to the hospital. So to me, it didn't matter if we were connected or not. To me, what mattered was that the patient needed better care and that we were able to provide that service. And I even had a physician, I called back and say, Hey, um, you're like five miles away from this patient. Um, uh, why are you giving me this patient? This patient was recommended and they said, oh, we came from a such and such facility because uh, someone uh, told me that I should come here. And he started just wondering, they started asking questions. What, what's happening here, right? Like when a physician gets about six referrals in a week and they're coming from one place, they start asking questions and they're like, Hey, what's going on here? We're like, Hey, we're just trying to connect these patients so they can have a better engagement. We're trying, uh, not to reduce our EO volume because our goal is to help the patient overall. And, uh, and so that story, those kind of stories, they started coming back to us and say, Hey, what is it that you're doing? And, uh, in return, sure. All those facilities or all those physicians would start sending us back something. You know what? That's that that's icing on the cake it's not the ultimate goal but um but uh it was an olive branch that we uh, planted that became a tree and now has branches all over yeah so say more about that uh as far as like just physicians interacting provider groups interacting with the health system or what do you mean by that uh you mean uh in network I mean, like you said, it was like a, a seed that became a branch that is now a, a sort of spreading tree. And I just, uh, I mean, it's very poetic, but I just would love to understand oh, just my more what you mean by that. Yeah. Um, and you, you start, you start hearing, um, back to us, uh, patients that were battling with diabetes and now they're saying, Hey, the doctor was able to spend more time with me. I knew one doctor that he would spend an hour sitting with patients and he would never mind about doing it. So I would send him that patient, knowing that there's a diagnosis, a possible diagnosis that the patient, I would look at all the entire information that became that the chief complaint why they came here and just try to understand, is there more to that visit for the patient? And uh, we started connecting them, P uh, pediatrics. We had a lot of pediatrics um, involved because now they they have that someone that they can relate to, that can speak their language as well, and they can have a better conversation. There, that patient already feels at like ease. So that that branch became a canopy of uh, of relations, right? Where everybody started saying, "Hey, you know what? I don't have to have an agenda for me to grow." It was, "Hey, we're here to grow all together," and ultimately help our community. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you think like most places, I'm always like fascinated by the community aspect of patient navigation, which is like where there are a lot of connected nodes that often go overlooked, right? Like the places that matter, like churches or community centers or things like that. Um, they're important, right? Yeah. They're like, they're, they're places where 
people gather that have influence over communities and populations, and yet often they always seem to be a, a at least in what like healthcare talks about patient navigation or, or population health. It's like those settings, churches and community centers or, or what have you, um, they don't always get talked about as much uh, their importance. Um, what do you think, do you think that's a blind spot for healthcare systems or, or like, how do you see the role of, of those type of organizations playing in patient navigation, population health, this moment in time of, um, community health? Uh, I think those places that you mentioned, they're going to play a bigger role than they did before. They were overlooked. <clears throat> Say, for example, I noticed that a patient comes in through the ER and when I ask them, Hey, Mr. Patient, can I get you address? Oh, my address is so, or I don't have an address. So you have a family member that's uh, somewhere nearby and they say, no, I'm homeless. Okay. So what do we do with that patient? The patient doesn't have an address, doesn't have anything, but that's a red flag. That's an indicator to me to have, Hey, now I can get one of these two other entities involved, right? Maybe I can get a food bank involved right away. And I already gathered some information or tree from the triage, right? If the patient has high blood pressure, high blood sugar, whatnot. If I'm going to refer that patient to, for them to have a, a better care, perhaps for, for a week or something until they settle, provide that to, Hey, I know this food bank is open this day. Can you re refer that patient, give them that, have those cards available with you and say, Hey, listen, this day, so-and-so is giving out some food and on the back end, you go and you tell the, uh, the, in this case, the food bank or the church that's providing that service and you tell them, Hey, listen, uh, I have a patient with me. I can't disclose the information, but he has hypertension and diabetes. How powerful is that? Because now I can tell the church and say, in the event that someone comes and I can give them a card, right? like a ticket card, uh, to go to this place, you're already identifying yeah. and the patient come, that person comes into this facility and they say, oh, I'm not going to give this patient a lot of pasta, a lot of fruit and a lot of starch a lot of in the food bank bag, right? Now we can start connecting those in having, oh, maybe I can have a different type of source to put in those bags as a food bank. So you start the interaction is much bigger than we think now, because now you can now either the church or the food bank can start reaching out to different facilities and say, Hey, listen, we have this type of population that's coming through our doors. Do you have this to donate to us? And there are a lot of people that yes. can do that and say, absolutely. We have all of this uh, resources available. People are there to provide what we need. We just need to ask that we need to be intentional about what we're doing. Yeah, it's crazy too. Like in, in that example, it's interesting. It's like you think about like a food bank and overwhelmingly probably, and to be clear, I'm just going to make up the statistic, mm -hmm. but like you think about like the type of donations that a food bank typically get, right? Canned beans, uh, canned fruit, boxes of noodles. Like it's not stuff that's, help, it's not stuff that's like overwhelmingly good for a diabetic. Exactly. And so... And that food bank would not know that person, they didn't know the person was diabetic, but they think they're helping. And they're like, here's a bag of food. That's probably not good for your health condition. Um, and so then if you've done sort of a lot of work to help that patient and now like at the last minute, it's like something is going to go wrong. That's going to like derail all of that progress, uh, ruin that trust in the food bank and stuff like that. So I love that being able to connect the dots between the patient's condition, if they're going to a food bank or if they're getting help from somewhere else, uh, that like really the, those dots are fully connected to ensure that patient is getting the help they need 
that trust is going to still be there, that they're not going to, that they're going to buy into the, to the system and that patient journey, um, in a lot of ways, that's very powerful, um, to do that. And, you know, James, um, I'm going to say this and it's probably a lot of people are not going to like it, but the terms we use for, we use, um, admit and discharge for patients, right? Admit to what? Oh, time of revival. What is that? And then discharge, man, that just sounds ugly, right? We should never discharge a patient, right? Never, ever. We should navigate the patient from one place to the other, whether that patient it's in our facility or it's within other, um, communities or other areas, but we should never discharge that patient. That patient should always have in that example of the, uh, 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 a patient that, that's diabetic. If we don't have those resources, connect them or find different uh, places that are providing di diabetes, uh, classes. And route them. Especially in a population health setting where the whole system is responsible for the care of that patient, whether it's happening in the hospital, whether it's happening exactly at a physician clinic, it's all the same team. And so, yeah, that idea of the hospital discharging the patient, it's like, not my problem anymore. Yeah. It's and in a population health setting, like it, it's still busy yeah. actually. Um, but I do think to your point, like words do matter. I, I think, um, the way in which, you know, yeah, you talk about discharges or, um, these things, I do you think to, to some degree in the way that a patient feels comfortable interacting with the system, all of those things matter, right? Um. And so I, I don't think it's, um, yeah, maybe it'll get flack from some people, but I don't think it's a, uh, uh, it's, I don't think that's a horrible thing to, to say by any stretch of the imagination, especially as we're talking about how you help a patient interact and, and navigate with their health and with the health system. And frankly, under the best of circumstances, like navigating a healthcare journey can be scary and problematic, even for for someone like me, right, who is, I'm a white male, I'm middle class, I'm highly educated, right? It's like, I, I have every advantage in navigating my healthcare journey. And sometimes for me, it can be very overwhelming and hard to do. And I can't imagine what it's like for someone who doesn't speak English and is trying to find a doctor who they are comfortable with, or they feel like the only place they can turn to is the ER, or they feel like they, they can't turn anywhere, um, to get care. And so I think like health systems need to be very cognizant of that. It's like, they need to build systems that are comfortable and accessible for all patients, not just sadly people who look like me. Yeah. And that's a good point. Um, and that's where, and that takes a lot of, uh, courage from the leadership team in, in taking that bias away from, uh, at the door, right. Where you see the patient as a human being, you don't see the patient as a client or anything. You see that person as a human being. And I think that's the most important part that we need to start relating to the people that come through our doors as humans. It's not patients, because if it's a patient, today is a patient, it's gone in one hour. No, that human interaction that still needs to be there. It's there, create the relationship, create something that you can bind to that patient so that you can continue going on. Because I think when we start uh, looking at people as humans, we tend to act differently and the patient doesn't feel like they're a number anymore. And like you say, uh, the way we say things matter a lot. The, it prefaces what comes next, right? So if we look at a host, and then, uh, what is your name? And not refer to like, oh, to your guys another patient. Let's make the connection where it's going to be an everlasting relationship. Yeah. 
That's awesome. So what um that project kicked off, what do you think a lot of health systems need to do? And why does patient navigation matter now? Like in this moment in time, if you're advising other um, healthcare organizations, um, maybe they don't have a full navigation strategy in place. Maybe they're just starting to think about it. What do you advise them? Um, what do they need to think about, you know, this year, the next six months, right. To start putting in place for next year, start to move fast when it comes to their patient navigation approach and strategy and where, what kind of advice would you give them? Uh, I think you need to acknowledge, uh, gather, you need to gather your team quickly and, and identify those areas as, uh, and ask the hard questions. You need to be able to be uncomfortable in the moment, but not target it because there's a difference when, uh, leaders come in one place where you start asking questions, you feel targeted, right? And it shouldn't be that, Hey, this is not to pick on anybody, but this is to come to a reality check to identify if we have that or not. And if we don't identify who the key players are that can help you, and you're going to need someone that has a strong, uh, patient relations and analytical mind as well to provide that information and that, so now we're talking about a team. Uh, how do you put a team together? Because you're going to need IT help. Uh, you're going to need a finance uh, part of it to help you identify those areas. And most of all, you need to have uh, a team that's going to be 24 seven in contact with those patients. So you can start gathering information, um, and then, uh, moving to different phases and to make it a reality where you're connecting every single patient that comes to your door to a primary uh, physician where within six months, when you're filling out a, uh, a registration conversation, whenever you ask the patient, oh, Mr. Patient, what's, who is your primary care physician? Oh, it's Dr. James. Oh, it's Dr. George. Or and so you don't have that. Uh, I don't know. That's yeah. a big problem. And, uh, and the easy way to, to find that, whether you have it in your system or not, is to ask an, an, an analyst and just say, Hey, run me a report on who the primary care physician is on all patients that have not, that come through our doors the last three years. And you'll be surprised how much data is going to come back and say no PCP or the line, right? And that's where you're going to see the opportunity. You're going to find the opportunity that you have it or not. Yeah, that's interesting. I love that as a starting point of, it's just like a, like a simple approach to just to be like, okay, like patients need a PCP and if they don't have one, we need to connect them with one. And so let's go identify all the patients who don't have one and do that legwork to just, um, connect those dots. How else? So that's one, I and mean, that's a great too, because it's a very measurable thing. Percentage of patients in our Epic or Cerner that don't have a PCP. Um, do you have other ways to think about how you would measure patient navigation programs and efficacy? Um, besides ensuring that every patient has a PCP doctor attached to them, but are there other things that you would look at, um, as uh, health systems are building these programs. Like what are the things they should be thinking about in terms of knowing, just knowing that they're on the right track and doing a good job, um, with their programs. Uh, and more in depth, um, analysis would to, would be to run your, um, your, your, uh, patient pool in, the, in your system and the last two years and pull up to diagnosis, uh, one through five. And identify those diagnoses and identify, uh, uh, and start grouping them as in, this is a chronic disease, this chronic disease or whatever that's coming through and only run it for ER patient type, uh, or that was flagged that came through the ER. And you're going to be surprised that your 99213, uh, code is going to come up a lot and how frequent those items came through. Is going to tell you that you have a PCP problem because all of those are primary care physician visits. 
or should have been primary care physician visit. And so that, yeah. that's another way of identifying that. For people who don't know, and I'll just admit myself, uh, what's that 9912? Oh, the, the level one ER code, the procedure okay. code. Okay. 99213. Got it. It's okay. going to be in your level one uh, ER level. That's where you group all of those visits, cough, uh, pain, uh, slides, cut, kind of things like that. Um, and when you start looking at, uh, when you are intentional about the data that you have, because we have all of that available, it's just that you need someone that can read it and group it for you. And then and in a one pager, I always tell myself, if you can't tell anyone in less than as half a page of what the issue is or what you can do, you have a problem because you've lost the story, but you need to have presented to one page and say, this is everything that we have and half a page of all patients that come through the ER that could have been a primary care physician visit. And when you lump that in, in you present it to, to that, to, to the team, to the finance team, or your CFO or our, or your medical chief medical officer, you, you tell them we have opportunity here. We have opportunity to help our communities. We have opportunities to decrease our ER charge because all of these patients are coming here using our ER like a clinic. It's amazing. And I love the, if you can't boil your problems down to one page, you've lost the story. That is, uh, I love that nugget. That's, uh, that might be the headline of the show. Um, Sergio, uh, this has been great to have you on. Is there anything we haven't touched upon related to patient navigation that you think is like worth mentioning to our listeners? Uh, it's, um, and when we're talking about patient navigation, we start saying it, oh, that's someone else's problem. And it's not, that's everybody's uh, problem. And by that, if I see someone in need, I need to be open. And if I see a friend that I heard that, that, oh, I went to the ER, hey, what happened? Um, be intentional. I think we need to be intentional nowadays in, in asking our friends, hey, you, are you okay? What's happening? How can I help you? I think when we go with the mindset of how can I help you, your mind is going to find those ways of helping people. And there are a lot of people out there that are in need and, um, and we're all in one team. We're all in one team. And like you said, there are a lot of other areas in our community that can help. There's the fire department, there are churches with their outreach. Churches are looking for outreach programs to connect. How do we connect everyone into one circle where we're all interconnected and, uh, and, and when we say that it's easier said than done because there's that selfish part of us, right? That I want to come on top and say that I was the one that did it. No, we can all share. <laughs> this is an all effort for our community and everyone is going to improve. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, Sergio, thanks so much for joining the program and making the time. I, uh, I appreciate you having on, uh, we'll have to have you on again. Um, you've been a fantastic guest and I think, uh, I definitely feel like we could go even deeper on patient navigation, but this has been such a great, uh, such a great taste. Um, thank you for all the work you're doing, um, to do just that for patients and, uh, it is very commendable. So thank you. Thank you, James. I love the opportunity.